please uh, let me introduce uh, Jean Pierre Sonnet. Jean Pierre Sonnet uh, <coughs> uh, grad uh, did his licentiate at the Pontifical Biblical Institute on uh, Isaiah, on the book of Isaiah, and then he continued his study in the United States. And uh, we can immediately see that Jean Pierre has two legs. One was in the United States. He studied with uh, Ackerman at Indiana uh, University, but the other was developed by the Tel Aviv University with uh, Steinberg. And uh, <clears throat> he wrote uh, several interesting books, uh, important books like uh, the book within the book, uh, and he's involved in many international projects. But uh, I think that each of you who are studying here in Rome, you cannot leave Rome without reading his poetry on Rome is something really fascinating. So many thanks, Peter, and many thanks, Imogen. It's quite something to have to speak after you, <laughs> <laughs> with or without a Roman corner. <laughs> I would like to start by, strangely enough, by inviting you to leave this place and to gather on the Campo dei Fiori. Around a, a plaque, just behind the statue of uh, Giordano Bruno, the plaque installed seven years ago commemorates the burning of the Talmud that took place on the Campo on September 9, 1553, sad to say, at the order of the Roman Inquisition. The memorial opens with a citation of the Talmud, tractate Avodazara, Gilayon Nisrafim Vautiot Pochot. That is, the scroll, the parchment, is burning, is burned, but the letters are flying. So spoke Rabbi Hanania, a sage of the second century, when the Romans burned him alive for ignoring a ban on teaching the Torah. Rabbi Hanania died while hugging, embracing a scroll of the Torah. What do you see? His uh, disciples asked. I see that the scroll is burning, but that the letters are flying. The second quote, the second quote is the first line of a famous kina in the style of the book of uh, Lamentations. Shali schufava esh lishlom avelaich. I ask. You who were burnt in, in fire, the peace of those who won, mourn you. This is the opening line of a famous uh, poem written by a young Jew who became the renowned Rabbi Meir ben Baruch. A student in a yeshiva in Paris, Meir was the eyewitness of the mass burning of some 12,000 Talmudic manuscripts in Paris in 12. 42. Sad to say, the burning was the culmination of a process initiated here in Rome by Pope Gregory IX. Now, why did I invite you to gather around the memorial on Campo dei Fiori? I wanted to share something I had been an eyewitness of one year before the installation of the memorial, a gathering took place on the campo. Among other speakers, Daniel Boyarin gave a speech. He insisted that while remembering the tragic event of 1553, we had to remember other occurrences that took place at the same time. In monasteries, schools and cities, Small groups, very small groups of Jews and Christians met and learned from each other. He mentioned some of them, and he added, this is the company 
we keep. Let me mention just one of them, not only because he comes from my country, but also because he died in the very year of the tragic event in Rome. This man, this Christian, has dedicated his life to the exact opposite of the destruction of Jewish books. He spent his life making Jewish books, printing them. His name was Daniel Bomberg. A Catholic printer from Antwerp in Flanders, Bomberg settled in Venice and became the first non-Jewish printer of Hebrew books of all sorts, biblical commentaries, the first printed Mikraut Gdolot, prayer books, responsa, and works of law, philosophy, and ethics. Bomberg's most impressive accomplishment is the publication of the Editio Princeps, on the slide, of the Babylonian Talmud, which he completed in under four years. Jews and rabbis were his co-workers in the press, and the famous Elias Levita was among them. Here is the front cover, the cover page of the Maseret Eduyot, a tractate of the Talmud. If you can read in Hebrew, in Perush Hanesher Agadol, with the commentary of the great eagle, Rabenu Moshe Bar Maimon, that is Maimonides, and then Nitpas Al Yude Daniel Bomberg, printed by Daniel from Bomberg in 1521, Venezia. This man, a Christian, wanted his name to be printed in Hebrew. Now, Bomberg, Elias Levita, and others I will mention are the company we keep, we want to keep, at the Bea Center, at the Gregorian, at the Biblican. I would like now to express my debt to Jewish mentors who welcomed me into this company. They introduced me into the two main avenues of traditional Jewish biblical interpretation, Pshat and Drash, Pshat and Midrash. As you know, a traditional page of the Torah, Chumash, displays next to the Masoretic text the Targum Onkelos in Aramaic, and then on the bottom, at the bottom of the page, the commentary by Rashi. Rashi, that is Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzrak, Rashi de Troyes in Champagne, in the north of France, in the 11th century. I like this stamp by the French postal service. Uh, Rashi Exegete was also a winemaker. Uh, how not to be a winemaker when you live in Champagne? <laughs> <laughs> but since, since the Middle Ages, Rashi has been the gate to the Torah for generation of Jewish readers, and it has been so for me. Back in 1985, I was a student for one semester at the Ratisbon Center, the ancestor of the Bea Center. I took some classes at the Hebrew University, in particular a class by Professor Sarah Kamin, the Chona Livracha, about Pshat and Drash in the exegesis of Rashi. In some sense, it is a class I have never left it has provided me with a set of rules that still guide me, inspire me. And first of all, this rule. En mikra yotse mide pshuto. No scripture, no unit of scripture literally comes out of its contextual meaning. 
No scripture can, should escape from its contextual meaning. And since it is meant as a rule, it is often translated as no scripture can be deprived of its contextual meaning. The key word in the rule is the word pshat, sometimes translated as literal sense, but better translated as contextual sense, since the word pshat connotes a form of extension, uh, inscription in the context, in the dynamics of narration. The rule is mentioned three times in the Babylonian Talmud, Yet, it has gained full relevance in Rashi's exegetical project, continued by a school called the school of the Pashtanim. I mean, that is, the masters of the Pshat. And Daniel Bomberg has been the first to print the collection of the commentaries, the Mikraot Gdolot. Rashi, in the 11th century, came after the, follow, the flowering of Midrash and was perfectly trained in the tradition in question. Yet, he set himself an exegetical goal that departed from Midrash, from the Midrashic venture. This goal was not met, meant against, to stand against Midrash, but was intended as a way to balance Midrash with an essential hermeneutical principle. Midrash, as you know, is a synonym of multiplicity of meanings, profusion of interpretations, and this because of the infinite wealth of meanings incorporated in scripture. A Talmudic rule, rule expresses in that sense the, I would say, the inner spring of Midrash. Here is it. Mikra echad yotze lechamate amim. Scripture, one unit of scripture, literally comes out, eventuates in several meanings, te amim. The biblical verse, traditional, traditionally attached to the rule, is the well-known verse from Psalm 62. Achat diber Elohim, shtaim zu shamati. Once, once, God has spoken twice. Shtaim, twice. I have heard this. Every divine utterance in the scripture has thus at least two distinct meanings. At least up to 70 and even beyond. Another Biblical verse, Jeremiah 23, 29, is used to mark this multiplicity of senses. It's not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. These pieces, these uh, sparks, are the multifarious meanings of scripture produced by Midrashic activity. Now, against the background of these uh, fireworks comes Rashi. His originality, his genius, lies in his, in his way to coordinate the basic rule, the core rule of Midrash, with the basic rule of Pshat. Rashi starts with the biblical verse, Achad diber Elohim, shtaim zu shamati, once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. Then he states the basic rule of Midrash, Mikra echad yotze de chamat amim, and then he balances it. That's the originality of Rashi with the Pshat rule. Ultimately, the soft davar, in le kramikra yotze mide mashmau. Ultimately, scripture cannot be deprived of its contextual meaning. 
Rashi's golden rule is exemplary. Whatever might be the Midrashic fireworks you can produce with the hammer and the rock of God's word, you cannot do this at the expense of the contextual meaning of scripture. In most cases, it's narrative meaning in the flow of narration. And Rashi took it upon himself to promote the final part of the rule. At, uh, some, at one point in his commentary in uh, Genesis 3, he says, Lo bati ela lipshuto shel mikra. I didn't come except for the pshat of scripture. And he did so, so the expounding of, of pshat with consummate art. As a Catholic in the classroom at the Hebrew University, as a Catholic and as the only Catholic, I was under the spell. Yet, listening to Sarah Kamin, I realized that I had been preceded by other Catholics. Already in the 12th century, Christians, monks and scholars, started to learn from Rashi and from the Pashtanim. So did the Victorines. André, André et Hugues de Saint-Victor in Paris, who started to, as we say in French, to défendre et illustrer, the literal meaning, and who did so in the wake of Rashi's Pshat exegesis. Let me quote Hugues de Saint-Victor. You have it on the slide. The spiritual understanding of scripture is accessible only through what the letter proposes. And I'm amazed by the audacity of some who claim to be masters of allegorical explanations when actually they ignore the original sense of the letter. The Bible, Rashi and the Victorines assert, is not a grimoire, a palimpsest, or a spell book for unrelated and hidden spiritual codes. It tells a story, and a faith story, a story in its own right. This narrative sense, the pshat, is the home of any other sense. If, and only if, this story, the pshat, is duly acknowledged, and varolized, will scripture play its legitimate role in the faith tradition? Let me add a modern relevance to Rashi's rule, applying, applying it no longer to the context of the multiplicity of midrashic or spiritual senses, but in the context of the multiplicity of critical hypotheses. These hypotheses historical, redactional, sociological, and others, represent a sacred duty in modern biblical scholarship. Yet, they cannot exile us from the only non-hypothetical text we have and cannot dispense us from the duty to expound it. Ultimately, the soft davar, as Rashi puts it, scripture, cannot be deprived of its contextual meaning of what it says in its text and context. So far, for the pshat, et pour the midrash. Let's switch to the other side of the Jewish traditional exegesis, midrash. Does it mean we have to leave Rashi? No, strangely enough because Rashi does not hesitate to enroll Midrash at some points of his commentary. He does so, in particular, when the text of scripture presents anomalies, oddities, or apax legomena. Rashi then is twice as careful. He knows that scripture never speaks in vain. The singularity of the text therefore calls for extreme attention. In such cases, Rashi proposes double commentaries. He juxtaposes a commentary, le fi pshuto, according to the pshat, a 
according to the contextual meaning. And a commentary, a carefully chosen commentary, Kamidrasho, according to the Midrash, drawn from Midrashic sources. So, for instance, apropos Genesis 22:5, the Akeda, the binding of Isaac, Genesis 22, which will be our proof text this evening. Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there, go up there. In Hebrew, adko. Now, this use of the phrase adko is rare. To say over there, up there, one would have expected more common expressions such as shamma or ad enna. It is odd, in particular because of the use of ko, which means thus, here, so. This oddity prompts Rashi to provide two explanations. The first one in blue. Le fi pshuto, according to the pshat, which is a short distance to the place in front of us. And the second one of Midrashic nature and origin, I will, Abraham is speaking, I will see what will happen to the promise which God has made to me, ko, thus will be their the seed. The Midrash has that thus spotted in the use of ko in Genesis 22, a cross-reference to a previous use of the same word in Genesis 15, in the episode of the covenant. God then said to Abraham, look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Ko, so shall be your descent. For the Midrash, Abraham announces to his servants and makes clear to give, and makes clear to God that he goes ad ko up there in the mountain with the son of the promise to meet, maybe to challenge the God of the promise, to await the accomplishment, the paradoxical accomplishment of the promise ko so will be, shall be your descent. Rashi, the advocate of Pshat, thus reintroduces Midrash at some points, at some junctures of his commentary. And this in order not to miss the verses possible over determination of meaning. This is also the beauty of Rashi. His grandson, Rashi has been blessed with his grandsons, Samuel ben Meir, or Rashbam, became a purist, a staunch exponent of Pshat. Rashi, although a master of Pshat, paid attention, critical attention, to the great voice of Midrash, when the Pshat seemed to be pregnant with additional meanings. In my life as a scholar, I have taken the path of Pshat, more exactly of the modern critical version of it in narrative exegesis. Yet I keep receiving countless lessons from the medieval Jewish pioneers. And my first reflex in many cases is to open the Mikraot Gdolot, printed by Daniel Bomberg, and to consult Rashi and Rashbam the grandfather and the grandson, with a slight preference for the grandfather. <laughs> they are the company I want to keep. I have taken the path of Pshat, but I cannot hide my fascination for Midrash. Let me here salute another mentor, David Meyer, member of the Bea Center faculty with whom I have been reading Midrash for years. In Midrash, as uh, 
Daniel Boyarin puts it, all of scripture is potentially in conversation with itself. And this, thanks to the conversations the sages had with one another throughout the centuries. Reading Midrash, preferably with someone else, is therefore joining an ongoing conversation. I do it with thrill and awe. With thrill because there is a, a measure of playfulness in Midrash. In its way, for instance, to connect verses to verses, verses with verses, on the basis of similar wording, Gezerah Shava. I do it also with O, because in its combination of biblical text, Midrash addresses, embraces the most serious existential issues. Midrash thinks and thinks acutely with the words of scripture. With uh, David Mayer, I've been uh, recently reading Midrashim that connect the Akedah with Israel's ritual sacrifices. What is the link, if there is any, between the dramatic episode told in Genesis 22 and the sacrifices prescribed in Exodus and Leviticus? Midrash has its way to connect text and to connect things, always a surprising way. Let's have a quick look at two texts. The first, a midrash from the Mechilta, connects the Akedah with the first sacrifice prescribed in the Torah, the Passover sacrifice, the Passover lamb, commenting on the phrase, God will see the ra, God will see the blood, that is, the, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, on the lintel. The Mechilta offers this interpretation. When God sees the, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, what does he see? He sees the blood of the binding of Isaac. As it says, as scripture says, and Abraham called the name of that place, and now we are in Genesis 22, God will see, Yireh. And again, what did God see? God saw the blood of the binding of Isaac. As it is written, and it is the dramatic answer of Abraham to his son, Isaac, God will see for himself, Yirelo, the lamb for the burnt offering for the Holocaust. On the basis of the verbal links, the Midrash matches God's sight at the time of the Exodus with God's sight during the Akedah. What did God see in Exodus that prevented the death of the firstborn? God saw the blood of the binding of Isaac. In other words, the blood of the sheep, more precisely of the ram that was offered in place of Isaac. Much as the ram was offered in place of Isaac, the blood of the Passover lamb becomes a substitute for the Israelite firstborn. For the Midrash, the Akedah, far from being an event of the past, it has an abiding role, being always present in God's memory at the critical times of history. Let's move to the other text from Tana Dve Eliyahu. The Midrash comments on the verse of Leviticus, the verses of Leviticus about the burnt offering, the Holocaust. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, the priest is to offer a male without defect. He is to slaughter his, the shachatoto, that's a catchword with the akedah, on the side of the altar, to the north, before the Lord. To the north. The Masoretic text reads, Tsefona, which means to the north. The Midrash, however, 
slightly changes the vocalization of the word from tzafona to tzafuna, which means hidden. What is hidden before the Lord in any burnt offering day after day? What is hidden? The sin of the Akedah, the merits, the zchuyot of Abraham and the zchuyot, the merits of Isaac. And the Midrash ends with these amazing words. The heavens and the earth are my witnesses between Gentiles and Jews, between men and women, between male slaves and female slaves. When they read this verse, hidden before God, the Holy Blessed One remembers the binding of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Whenever the verse is read and read midrashically as meaning hidden before the Lord, it works as a reminder, reminder, a reminder to God of Abraham's and Isaac's merits. Far from walking ex opere operato, the sacrifices in the, san the sanctuary expand, elaborate the merits of Abraham and Isaac in their arduous and loving obedience. At the Bodleian Library in Oxford, a manuscript, a manuscript of the Torah is kept, which goes back to the 14th century in Germany. The opening page of Leviticus presents an illustration, and sorry for the poor definition, that encapsulates our reading. Here opens Leviticus Vayikra with the description of the sacrifices starting with the burnt offering. The scribe, however, has prefaced the sacrifices in question with a representation of the Akedah, allowing us to understand that all the sacrifices somehow carry on the merits of Abraham and Isaac in the Akedah. The illustration, moreover, presents the ram, the ram, provided by God in the Akedah, the ram caught in a thicket by its horns, as the one meant for the ensuing ritual sacrifices. Any sacrifice thus recalls God's providential intervention, providing a ram or another animal and preserving the life of the son, the life of Isaac and the life of any son. Judaism is the religion of the sons, of the daughters and of the sons. Now, one could wonder in front of such a representation, isn't Judaism largely not always, but largely an iconic, I mean reluctant to allow figurative art. In the 14th century, the Hebrew manuscripts were in most cases illuminated by Christian artists, carefully instructed by Jewish patrons and scribes. Collaboration took there another form, and I wish I could have attended the scene in the workshop of the Jewish scribe or the Christian artist. How did the Jew instruct the Christian? Did the Christian express some reflections about the analogy between Isaac in the Akedah and Jesus in his passion? Or about the merits of Isaac in every sacrifice and the merits of Jesus in every Eucharistic sacrifice? Let me end with a brief confession. Practicing Midrash, entering this conversation of scripture with scripture, I developed a sense of holy envy. Me too. I miss Midrash in my own Christian tradition. The New Testament is rich, is rich in Midrashic uses of scripture, and some, some, of the fathers of the church show midrashic reflexes. Yet for the most part, Christian theology and homiletics have followed and still follow the Greek way, which is the way of the concept, where scripture 
provides just the starting point. Midrash, instead, evolves from scripture to scripture, through scripture, and is so doing embraces life. And I do think that God's, God's faithfulness is much more perceptible when life is embraced by God's word rather than by concepts. I'll skip my final part about Christian Midrashim, and I would like to end up with this uh, wish. Uh, we were in good company tonight. Abraham and Isaac, Rashi, Daniel Bomberg, Sarah Kamin, Marilyn Robinson, didn't quote, Amy Jill Levine, and each one of you. This is the company we keep, the company we want to keep in memory of Cardinal Bea. I thank you.